This episode of Conversations with Shonda is going to talk about democracy and ranked choice voting. Today's guests include Kim Nelson and council member Anika Bowie. Kim Nelson worked for General Mills for nearly 30 years. During her career at General Mills, she held a number of senior brand and general management roles, including serving as the president of Snacks of the operating division. Kim served as senior vice president, external relations, leading on issues in crisis management, environmental, social and governance, and global external stakeholder relations. Kim retired from General Mills in 2018, and since then, she has continued to provide leadership and service to our city, our region, and beyond. She is an independent board director and sits on uh, several corporate boards. Council member Anika Bowie serves as a city council member of Ward 1. She is a lifelong St. Paul resident with a family whose roots go very deep. She is a big sister, a proud aunt a serial entrepreneur, and a creative in the field of arts for social change. Anika, I have known Anika. I have seen her be extremely involved in uh, local politics and leadership for some time. I'm very interested in talking with her and learning more from her. You're listening to Conversations with Shanta, a podcast that unpacks the community's grittiest, most vexing problems, hosted by Shanta Smith-Baker. Okay, Kim Nelson and Anika Bowie, welcome to Conversations with Shonda. I am going to just start out and um, ask you, Anika, to just do an introduction of, of who you are and why you are so important to this community. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for having me. You know, I was so excited to hear that I'll be joining today. I know whenever, you know, you're joining the Shana Baker's show, you have made it. You are, you know, vetted in the community. So just want to say thank you. I'm happy to be here. Uh, why I am important to this conversation. One, I have a new hat that I'm wearing as a St. Paul City Council member in Ward 1. Um, I am honored to to make history along my colleagues as an all-woman, um, first um, all-woman city council of a major city in the country. Um, I also am a, a daughter of Rondo. I grew up in St. Paul all my life. Um, I am a you know, Minnesota native and I uh, have a background not only in organizing, um, but ensuring that we're um, advocating for voting rights. I'm a defender of democracy. Um, I'm also an includer of multiple voices and expanding more people to the conversations when it comes to power and policies that govern our lives. And also I'm a, a fiance, I'm a daughter, I'm a sister, I'm a friend, I'm all around in the community and just, you know, trying to make sure that we can live quality lives and also just have like the joy and care and love that we need as a community. Thank you for that introduction. And one thing that I know that I believe that we share in common is that we come from families that have been deeply rooted in this community. And I think I read that your family has been in the Rondo neighborhood and in St. Paul, Minnesota for over 100 years. Yes, yes, correct. Over a hundred years, uh, I grew up uh, with family um, families who were business owners. So uh, my great aunt was Miss Arnellas, who owned the Arnellas nightclub on University. Uh, so that was just a staple um, in our neighborhood. And my dad, or my parents, I should say, owned a grocery store in a meat market right on Selby Avenue. So um, in my, I found out also uh, real quick in the Hennepin Library that my great great aunt owned a barbecue joint in Minneapolis where the Union Depot is now um, off Hennepin. So deep roots across the rivers, um, especially when it comes to like, you know, businesses being the backbone of our of our communities. I love it. And Kim, welcome to the conversation. I would love for you just to take a few minutes to just introduce yourself to the listening audience. Sure. Thank you so much for hosting us, Shonda. Um, I am somebody who comes from the business community. I'm a newcomer. <laughs> there are only 36 years here in Minnesota, so I uh, don't have those those roots quite as deep, but this is for sure my home. And um, I have gotten involved in trying to make sure that um, we are addressing the challenges, the many, many challenges and opportunities 
that we have in this great state and that we're meeting the needs of all of the state citizens. So, you know, what's brought me into this conversation is engaging as a retired business leader in our democracy and the responsiveness of our democracy. Yeah, Kim, I met you through the African-American Leadership Forum Mm -hmm. uh, many years ago. And, you know, whether you have been here for generations or whether or not you've been here for 36 years, you've decided to be engaged and to use the platform you've had um, and the understandings that you have to bring to ensure that every single person living in our state has opportunity. And so thank you for that commitment. Um, and I know there are many people listening that uh, are often searching for how they can make a difference. And I think what you did was just sort of jump in. We all, we all do what we can. Where we can, what, what we have. And so, Anika, tell me a little bit more about this all women city council, the first in the country. How did that happen and what was the ground game like? Oh, yeah, it's well, it's uh, here in in St. Paul. We have seven city council members. And, uh, you know, this wasn't something that we coordinated amongst ourselves. Um, We all have very different uh, diversity of of residents, of voters uh, in our areas. And uh, just to give some context, I actually ran in 2019. Uh, So that was like the first time I stepped into uh, the race, Uh, went from being a, a person who told people to get out to vote and, you know, put my name on the ballot and gave people a reason, you know, to get out to vote. And uh, so it's been a long ground game. Uh, We're around like conversations, having, educating people about why their voice matters uh, on a local level. You know, uh, we are now currently in a presidential uh, election, uh, but we have also always told people that every year is election year. There's never an off year. Um, when it came to city council, I think we just did a really great job with um, having conversations and having more so of a grassroots approach. Um, you know, like I mentioned earlier, having those deep roots, uh, the people that we were engaging in conversations and inviting not only to the caucus or inviting out to the cookouts and to the forums, um, where the grandmas, right? Where the aunties, where the cousins was the people who you know probably have no clue still to this day what my role is, but just understands that we need somebody that's from the community that trusts the community, um, that works along with the community. Uh, to be at the seat of the table. And I think also just what we've seen over you know the past decade of more young people and particularly people of color um, stepping forward and that this is a role that requires courage. Um, and we have always have said, you know, we want more people to be involved, but uh, we don't really have that like ecosystem or know how to support leaders. Um, so I am really fortunate to where like my community have uplifted me um, in this position. We have you know, also made sure that we had an education, an educational campaign to where it's uh, I have always said, you know, it's a community beyond the ballot. Right. It's not enough to where it's just we just drive people to the polls and then like you did your job. But we want to ensure that uh, as we're asking people to participate in their democracy, they're they're also participating in the policymaking. They're participating in the management of their tax dollars, right? They're participating in the investment of where, um, where, you know, initiatives should be funded. They're participating in the process making, right, Um, of, of democracy. So it was, I think it was a, it was a movement of, of faith in young people, a movement of faith in not only because we are women, but because we are the most experienced. You know, our voters elected us because they have seen us already doing the work. They have seen us already at the table advocating for, for them. And you know, they gave us the honors of um, electing us and now um, supporting us in this work in our next four years for this term. I love that. And what I love about it is sort of you breaking down the different ways that um, public policy 
impacts people on a daily basis. So Kim, I know you talked about democracy and I know I've seen you in education. I've seen you on other issues related to our economic progress um, Mm -hmm. of our state and particularly with African-American people. Can you just describe why why is working um, on this issue of democracy so important for you and what what should we understand about that? Yeah, Um, as you know, my passion has long been and continues to be education, front and center, first and foremost. I just feel like educating the next generation is is what needs to happen to prepare us to take our place um, in this growing economy. What I've come to believe that is that we all have our our lanes, the things that we care about. It could be climate. It could be, you know, um, voter restoration. It could be, you know, there's lots of different areas, healthcare. Um, but in the end, if the democracy itself is not responsive to the people, you know, you're not going to get to your need. And that's why I've in I've become very very focused on how do we make the actual democracy and our elected leaders more responsive? And when Anika talked about um, the community in St. Paul electing these women to their city council, it doesn't have to be women. It was the fact that the community rallied and said and figured out, we need to elect people who actually are going to focus on the things we care about. That's the miracle of what happened. That's the magic in it. The empowerment of the community to realize the blessing of living in a country and a state where you actually can, you can still elect people who represent your views. So, you know, I've become passionate about the system under which Anika and the others were elected, which is ranked choice voting. Yeah, and I think that that's a really helpful segue there because um, over the last little bit, I think we have become more engaged and uniformly getting more vocal about issues facing our community. I think that that vocal, us being vocal and the intention plays to, let's say, issues in policing or issues in education doesn't always translate to people voting. And so there are just so many reforms that are happening to make that um, representation more possible, to create spaces and ways for people to express what their priorities are, to express who their candidates are. And one of those ways is ranked choice voting. So what is it? So ranked choice voting in its simplest term is instant runoff voting. So as a voter, you specify your preferred candidates. It's like Someone says, I'm going for ice cream. What do you want? Well, if they have chocolate, I want chocolate first. If they don't have chocolate, I'll take vanilla. My third choice would be strawberries and so forth. That's the simplest way to understand ranked choice voting. So in order to win a ranked choice voting election, you have to receive 50 plus one, 51 percent of the vote. So you cannot win an election with just 20 percent of the base of your district, in your district. You have to have a broader majority in order to win. And what's important about this is the behavior, and I hope Anika can talk about this. It's a it's a voting reform that incentivizes uh, coalition building, and it disincentivizes divisive, extreme attacks on opponents. That just doesn't work. Because as a candidate, you're working not just for the first vote, but for the second vote of your opponents. So this behavioral change, I think, is something that um, is really helpful. It also, one of the things we see is more diversity, more women, more people of color in ranked choice voting elections. There's some research on this. And the reason is because people feel they have a chance. There's no spoiler effect. If I run, I've diminished the chances of the party to win this election or so forth. The spoiler threat goes away. Um, Repeat elections, the expense of a a second election in the case of an election that's too close, completely goes away. So these are some of the the benefits that I think um, ranked choice voting can bring us. And on top of all of it is just a more responsive 
representative democracy. Mm-hmm. And I think, could you follow up with that on the coalition uh, building point that Kim just raised? Absolutely. And I just, I love Kim, how you just described it so simply. Um, Cause I think, you know, people think about voting, right. As this, you know, complicated um, system, but what ranked choice voting, I tell people like we rank our favorite sports. We're doing that right now through March madness. We rank our, you know, our favorite song artists, you know, we saw that with how, you know, people were nominated through the Oscars. So this is just another opportunity for us to rank our um, representatives. But being in the, um, in the, just as a candidate, you know, and also as elected official and someone who's organized on plenty of um, campaigns in the past, what I really uh, like about ranked choice voting is it being a strategic tool. Right. It's it's a good tool for persuasion um, to where when you are engaging in conversations with people, um, it is not just you're not asking them to participate in a dichotomy of just one or the other. Right. Um, You're not asking them to go to the ballot box and choose the lesser of an evil. You're asking them, depending on what race it is and how many people are actually in that race, you're. opening up the door to have more conversations around values, which is like the most like people to people centered way that like our democracy should function. Right. Um, And uh, people uh, also like have to work towards that. And in my race that I just had, um, I had the most people in my race. I had, it was a seven, seven way race and counting, you know, actually every day someone was jumping in and, uh, you know, a lot of people were checking in with me like, Hey, how are you? Okay. Is, you know, how should you feel about that? But I think I actually was happy, um, because in a system of ranked choice voting, that's going to increase, turnout. The more candidates we have in the, on the ballot, the more turnout that we have, the more opportunities that we have to talk with constituents or excuse me, with voters. Um, it also allows for a clearer contrast for that voter um, to where, you know, if their issues is around housing, the conversations, whether it's at the forums or at the doors, is going to be driven by certain issues that they want to prioritize, right? Um, and it doesn't allow allow us to like pigeonhole um, a candidate. Um, And also too, uh, I tell people, especially in the local elections, it doesn't matter if you're red, blue, green, or rainbow, everybody wants their um, roads to be fixed. Everyone wants accessible parks and libraries and rec centers, right? So it allows us to participate in a truly nonpartisan way, um, especially for, um, our organizations that are building and coalitions to where, you know, if they want to get behind a cause, it's because of the the um, diversity of the candidates that's on the ballots. Um, I, m- I mentioned turnout already. I do want to touch on, um, you know, as a candidate, uh, I, like I said, it was a seven way raise and I probably raised, probably, I was probably the third most um, 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 earning, um, when fundraising. So it really, like really the, the work can, came down to how much people are going to invest into people, um, power, right. Into organizing grassroots, organizing relational organizing and, um, you know, versus, uh, how many rich friends that you have that can finance your campaigns, right. Versus voting. Sorry to interrupt. Mm-hmm. So right code voting essentially uh, forces, if you will, the electorate to be more, uh, it provides more opportunity for people to be informed and in relationship yes. with the people yes. that's voting for. Yeah. You were in a seven way race or plus, right? So yes, how, yes. how many votes do you get in a ranked choice voting? Is it the top two? Is it the top three? Like, how does that work? So uh, it's in St. Paul, I believe there was five, five um, ranking choices. So uh, the voter basically can rank um, one through five. 
Um, and so in a seven ray race, they, you know, out of that seven, five people, they could rank. Uh, what we normally saw was, you know, some people voted, you know, rank their, uh, first like three or four, um, in my race for the election days, there was a reallocation of, um, of ballots. Um, so basically none of us made it over the, 55% or 51% threshold. Um, So uh, we were at, you know, Ramsey County and uh, um, all of the election officers had to count, you know, ballots. And uh, after three or excuse me, five rounds, um, then I was elected. Uh, So we saw, I mean, and also um, in that process, um, candidates and campaign teams can, you know, have access to see what the rankings and it was that was great information as well, too, in terms of um, that coalition building that Kim was talking about uh, to where we had an opportunity to work with candidates to so where someone on the door said, hey, you know, I like you, but I met so and so earlier and we had a great conversation and I gave my you know vote to that person instead of you know trying to convince them of otherwise. It was an easy ask to say, well, would you rank me as your second or third? I like that. So, Kim, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in because I think there are two important pieces. One, Shonda, you mentioned, and I think this is true, that in a ranked choice voting election, you you are compelled to get to know your constituents better, not just the ones you know well, there's some percentage you know well, but to get beyond that and actually as a candidate, ask yourself, can I, I hear this need over here. Can I bring that into, you know, my focus area in order to capture this group of the electorate? And you're also going to get to know your fellow, you know, your competitors better and in a more positive way, because you're hoping for a second vote. So in a normal election, there's no incentive to do that. You just would run as much negative advertising as you could without fear of alienating your opponent's supporters. So that's, to me, the essential difference um, in these two things. The other thing I just wanted to, you know, put a fine point on that Anika spoke to, just technically what happens in, in a ranked choice voting election you rank your candidates, say there are five candidates, in the first round of the vote, if none of those five candidates achieves the 51 percentage majority, then the last candidate is dropped off and that candidate's votes, second, uh, third, and fourth votes are reallocated amongst the remaining candidates. So mm-hmm. that that's the process, just to be clear, um, until one candidate gets to the 51% as Anika mentioned. Yeah. So um, just to summarize, if I'm a candidate and I'm going out, I don't want just the number one votes. I want two and three. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So in order to get them, it means I have to engage with the voter to Uh say, I may not be your first or second choice, but I would sure love it. And we connect on this issue And, you know, if I'm elected, I will, you know, I'm going to serve this entire community. It provides a space for the dialogue to happen. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly. It's a behavior change. Mm -hmm. It is a behavior change. It is a behavior change. And um, as I understand it, uh, Kim, that this process actually allows for the things that we've talked about, but it also creates room for more diverse representation to happen. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It does. It why? does. Or how does that work? Why Why is that the outcome of this? I'll weigh in, but we need to hear from Anika because, you know, <laughs> she's the one who like got motivated to vote. I yeah. think a lot of people feel alienated from the political process and don't want to go through the hell of running and having someone throwing mud at you and your family or who whoever. It just, it, it's not interesting. Um, and I think because of this nuance in a ranked choice voting election, there's less of that. I'm not saying there isn't any of that, but there's less of that for sure. And so I think it just makes the idea of running more accessible. So you don't have to be maybe the, the one for sure you're gonna win, Maybe, you know, you're one of seven, but you have a chance. 
And I think that's the problem for women and people of color. A lot of times we feel like the deck is stacked against me. Why am I even going to try this? The, the party's already decided it's this candidate yeah. you know, mm-hmm. and I don't have a chance. But because of this ability, if I'm good at building coalitions and I can, you know, really get out there and door knock and get some second votes, I have a chance. So I think that's why people. And I can add to that as well, um, especially around the coalition building and even just, uh, you know, getting past that, you know, fear, right, of of putting yourself out there, putting your name on the ballot. Um, And I think uh, it also invites people to run, not because they think they have a chance at um, winning, but running because there's an issue that's missing from that um, that political you know conversation, um, and I've seen that especially you know in my race you know within a seven way race um, there was a lot of people who who also was in support of me who um, said hey if you don't um, you know if you rank uh, me first rank Anika um, second um, so it allows for even on the ballot as candidates for us to work together. Um, around issues, around safety, you know, more localized issues. And um, like I mentioned before, um, you know, fundraising is is a bulk of, of um, you know, running for office that, you know, could scare a lot of people away. But I think especially with ranked choice voting, um, they do fair, cho- or I should say fair vote, um, does a really great job with educating people, um, doing outreach, the visibility on the doors with letting people know about the process also is very helpful. It um, invites you into a, a, a coalition of people who are sharing with everyone of how to have access to the ballot. It also just, you know, so you're not the only person educating people on the doors about, you know, the ranking system. So we've talked about some of the the benefits, which seem to be many in terms of ranked choice voting. Kim, what are some of the misconceptions Yeah, I I think the biggest one is the notion that it's complicated and it it is not complicated. As Anika said, we're not confused about this concept of how to how to rank things. This is something deep in our our society, our culture. Everybody knows how to do this, whether it's pizza or ice cream. Um, And I think opponents um, have to find something. And that's the thing I hear most is that, and one thing that we do see that sort of validates this, how complicated is it, is that once ranked choice voting is adopted, people love it. Voter turnout is higher. Voter engagement is higher. Voter satisfaction is higher. So there's surveys, post-election surveys that, you know, have captured this over time. And I think the reason is because people feel they've been able to rank their vote, their conscience and rank their choice. And they're fully able. They're not suppressing what they want to do. They're able to do what they want to do at the ballot box. Mm-hmm. When I when I'm listening to this, uh, for whatever reason, is coming to my mind is party politics. Mm-hmm. And um, there's a lot of polarization um, in our elections in these days. and what it seems to me is that it actually can expand the party to include the diversity that sits within it um, in a way that maybe traditional voting has not allowed for. Anika, would you agree Mm -hmm. with that? Oh, yes, 100 percent. Like I mentioned before, um, you know, I used to be a political director for the DFL party, um, you know, when um, our our brother, uh, Attorney General Keith Ellison, was um, on the ballot And, uh, you know, I saw that really the polarization, you know, that happens um, on any race, um, especially on a local level. And I, you know, I love to um, participate or participate more in a nonpartisan way, um, just because I think uh, when people are, you know, um, holding strongly to party lines, it doesn't allow them to really take a um, full human approach around like, what is it that we truly need? Um, and, uh, it also allows for the behavior, like we've been, um, sharing to change around, it it changes the conversation, you know, um, to where, you know, we're having a conversation around like the future of our youth, right? That's, uh, a a little more compelling than, uh, you know, talking about, 
property taxes, right? Uh, so when, um, also like another misconception about ranked choice voting is people um, talk about the time, like, oh, it just takes so much time, you know, or even it takes time of, you know, on election day, I wanna know the results instantly. Um, and I think about just really, you know, when like that invested time and effort that we put into our democracy is valuable, right? We shouldn't want, you know, no one wants a, a cake that's baked in um, a few seconds. You know, we want to ensure that we have like um, care, you know, we have um, credibility, we have the invested investment with people. Um, and also another thing with ranked choice voting that it provides is uh, it creates jobs, uh, I think about just like the 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 work that went into counting those ballots. Those were, um, you know, county elections offices jobs to where like these are our caretakers of ensuring that um, our ballots are are counted. It's a transparent it's a transparent process. Uh, you know, it's an undeniable process. Um, and we're also um, ensuring at the end of the day that how people uh, chose to choose, you know, is um, is valid. And I think right now, you know, we're seeing on a on a on a national um, level of our democracy being attacked and like all the work that goes into um, people voting. And um, just because you don't like the outcome doesn't mean that the process isn't tried and trusted. So, yeah, I you know, I would just add. I think the biggest thing is that ranked choice voting really engages and empowers the electorate. And um, we're no longer just like, OK, here, do this. This is your candidate. You know, people do need to get engaged and, you know, learn more about the different candidates running so that they can, um, you know, make an informed ranking. So, you know, I think that's kind of the magic too. And people who don't like ranked choice voting maybe don't want an empowered, engaged electorate. Um, maybe they're okay with just a small, thin mi minority showing up, et cetera. Maybe they're okay with a large swath of the electorate feeling alienated and feeling like their vote doesn't matter and they can't make a difference. Mm -hmm. um, so that's another thing that I wonder about for. A yeah, point. I think the time piece, so Nick, I want to touch on a couple of things that you said. So one is around the time. So as I'm listening, um, I'm going to just put it on. I'm a new voter. Right. I've never voted. I'm 18 or I'm 50. And I've just decided that I want to get more engaged and I'm taking a step. Um, part of what I'm hearing is that the time commitment during the election, during the campaign process. Um, does require a little bit more time committed to getting to know the candidates. What I think we already do very well, and I might be over speaking or simplifying or making a set of assumptions here, but what we normally do is we understand who we don't want. <laughs> Whatever the one issue we don't like, I don't want them because they help put people in jail, right? We just write it off really quickly. And so one of the invitations here is that as those elections come up that are ranked choice is just taking a little bit more time to understand the positions that um, the candidates have taken, that it's not, um, that it does take a little bit more time on the front end to educate yourself on who's on the ballot. Is that fair? Just I say would say, I think it's also a two prong approach. Um, and when I was talking about time, I was thinking about also it takes it requires more time for a candidate to do that work of investing that time with someone who may be on the fence, who may not even, you know, care to vote. Right. Or may tell you right in your face, you know, you you on the north side, like I don't plan on voting for you. <laughs> and, no, um, you. you know, <laughs> exactly. So I You're think you know, choice. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Oh, yeah. I, you know, I, I got thick skin. And but I think especially with ranked choice voting, it attracts better leadership. Right. Because um, in a in a in a system that doesn't have ranked choice voting, uh, you know, the smart thing would do dealing with a voter who says, one, they're not voting Two, they're not even thinking about voting for you. You know, they're voting for someone else. The smart thing, what without a ranked choice voting system is you don't spend any more time with that person. Right. 
right? You know, you need to put your resources somewhere else. So um, that like relationship that was built or could have been built is no longer there. Um, with ranks choice voting, uh, it attracts you. It requires for you to um, spend more time with, you know, in those areas, a low voter turnout, right? Um, it requires you to also... Um, Treat people who you may see, you know, with another, you know, um, um, candidate's T-shirt on, you know, still treat them with dignity and care. Right. Um, and uh, and also too, not to look at your area that you're seeking to represent as just territory you need to, you know, carve out as yours and as the another um, candidate's areas. And, uh, you know, it creates like the opportunity to build that bridge. Um, even um, post election to where there are some people who they, you know, they were ride or die for, you know, for their candidates and it may not have been me, but I still, you know, have to um, do my due diligence of making sure I'm responding to the cause, um, you know, continuing to partner with them and um, continue to, you know, advocate for them, you know, so I think uh, it attracts a uh, type of leadership that is truly rooted in community, co- rooted in the collectiveness, um, and is rooted in, you know, expanding the coalitions and, you know, not casting out anyone just because, you know, they aren't vocal or visible with their support of you. And it also allows, um, I think, you know, as as a young leader, uh, we, especially coming up through the Obama era, Right. Of political organizing. Um, you know, I you know I'm surprised. I shouldn't say surprised, but um, I think sometimes, you know, we come across voters who aren't as vocal and visible with how they are going to vote, even like in, um, in discussion with them, too, where it's just like, OK, they're probably not going to tell you, but I not you- tell you type. Are you okay? See, I was I was going to have a word for it, but I didn't want to say the word for it. I was <laughs> I, I hold right. my cards a little close to the right. best. <laughs> well, you know, part of yeah. it, yep. I think that you, you know, when you, when people ask, I recognize that I can influence um, who they're voting for. And I think sometimes that makes sense to do. And sometimes I think that it's important for people to not just vote with the masses, but vote on the issues that matter to them. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so, and, you know, and I've had roles in where that's been complicated. So I'm just, I think I've just stayed closer to the, to the vest on the candidates, but not on the importance of voting. Right. And yeah. I think that's really what we're talking about is this is a new way of voting. One that expands both the candidates um, understanding of, of the areas that they will represent the people that live within them, but it, it creates expansion in so many ways that I think is important One of the things that I hope you both touch on, and Kim, I'll start with you, is, you know, we were talking about, you know, the North Side and some of our people that be like, look, not only am I not voting for you, sometimes they're like, I'm not voting. Yeah. Because my vote just does not matter. Right. Mm -hmm. I've seen the foolishness that is happening um, across uh, the elected uh, platforms, and I am just uninterested. It doesn't matter. What would you say to people that say it just does not matter? I would say, look at St. Paul, (laughs) look at this all female, diverse city council in St. Paul. Of course, you have the mayor as well. I just think that um, the proof is in the pudding in the end. And I think people who feel like it does this, we were talking about earlier, sort of the voter despair and which leads to disengagement. I think they need cause for hope. And I look at the St. Paul City Council and I think, wow, that's truly a representative, you know, democracy. That's what can happen if people don't don't feel like they can't make a difference. You definitely can't make a difference if you don't vote. That's 100 mm-hmm. percent. Mm-hmm. You know, so I think the the hopeful message is looking around. Look at Alaska, where you had Mary Peltola, the first indigenous woman um, a, a Democrat in Alaska elected through a ranked choice voting system, you know, yeah. so I think there's and that's something I mean, ranked choice voting has tremendous momentum nationally. You know, there are four states that um, are putting it on the ballot, trying to get it on the ballot. I, I don't know. They may all have it, but it's Idaho, Colorado, Oregon and Nevada. And isn't that interesting? You got some blue states, you got some red states because 
I think many people, regardless of your political persuasion, believe that the kind of extremism, the ever, ever more extreme on both sides is problematic. And electing leaders who have no interest in coalition building and no interest in actually problem solving for their whole constituency is not, that's not, we will never get any of these problems solved. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a piece of it as well. Shonda, if I may, I just wanted to touch on one other piece. We were talking about, um, you know, voter education on who's running and so forth. I think there's another interesting dynamic with a ranked choice voting election. A lot of times, Anika touched on it, a can, you might know which candidate you want. You might know at least that one. And that candidate often will help provide guidance for who they think is, you know, someone you should think about your second or third vote, uh, vote for. So there's that dynamic. Um, and then there's also the candidate themselves actually doing the work of deciding which of the candidates that are running against them. So both of those dynamics are positive, in my opinion, and helpful to the voter, you know, to simplify the task of voter education. Yeah, I think so. And I think that um, our communities are, are more informed than sometimes we even own ourselves. Um, yeah. People tapped in and you know how you feel about the schools, you know how you feel about the roads. I mean, let let them snow plows not come. <laughs> so oh, right. Mm -hmm. and, right. Um, I think that that we understand better than anybody the issues that are facing our families, um, mm -hmm. facing our communities. And so why not move through mm -hmm. voting and engagement to understand how we can rectify those issues and, and move our democracy forward? Anika, mm -hmm. what is bringing you the most hope um, in terms of where um, our democracy is going? right now um especially on the on the local level uh you know just being um in this space of making history right and it being a uh, women history month and um you know being highlighted and even at kim mentioning um uh, you know if you don't believe in voting look at the st paul city council and just like being a representation of that uh, what gives me hope, you know, I wake up every day just, you know, strongly believing that I am my ancestors' wildest dreams. And, uh, you know, in my office right now, I have a picture of um, Harriet Tubman, Michelle Obama with Rosa Parks and Coretta Scott, um, just always overlooking on me. And I need that. Right. And I need to be um always in spaces where I'm uplifted by uh, particularly Black women. You know, um, I think about um, Fannie Lou Hamer, who, you know, a lot of people recognize her from her quote, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. But she was sick and tired of being sick and tired because she was investing into building a democracy, investing into making sure that uh, when we are talking about Black farmers or we're talking about um, ending poverty or building wealth, right, um, fighting for freedom, fighting for our rights, that that is a triple effect of everywhere, not just only in down south, but just you know, any uh, woman, particularly woman of color who wants to step in her power, um, that these are opportunities and these are seats that are made available. Um, and how you get to the seat um, and the due diligence you do with building community, building the co coalitions, educating people to be voters, educating people to um, join committees and join their their local um, district councils, letting their voices be heard that it takes many hands. Right. Many hands make for light work. And how I remain hopeful um, is I stay I stay rooted in my family. You know, my family keeps me real humble. Um, 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 they keep me uplifted and um, and like, you know, although, yes, we are. It's a beautiful thing. We're making history. Uh, but I'm thinking I'm thinking 100 years from now. Right. Of just because someone had to think about us 100 years from now or ago. Right. Someone had to like pay the price to open up the door and pave the, the road. 
for us. And so I'm in the space of um, of hope. Um, I'm also in the space of joy that, um, yes, this work is hard, but it also is is beautiful. Right. Um, it is um, it's affirming because I I know that like the changes that we're making, particularly here um, on the council, um, is people are going to see the results. Right. So I now have to make good on my promise of why you should have went to that um, poll location and cast those ballots, why the voter education was so important, why these forms are, you know, are so important. Why, um, you know, encouraging other people to run for office, right, um, is so important because they need to see these tangible changes, right? They need to see the investment in their communities. They need to see, um, you know, us showing up, continuously showing up in community and helping to solve problems. So that's what keeps me hopeful. Um, that's what keeps me good, sane, you know, with, <laughs> with joy, um, I'm just so thankful for my family. I'm thankful for my community and I'm thankful for, you know, black women leaders in all positions of power because, you know, we have a shared understanding of um, the fight that we have every day. That's right. How about you, Kim? What's bringing you hope right now? Yeah, for me, um, the health of our democracy rests on the engagement of its citizenry. Full stop. Always has. And so the things that give me hope are the places where I see that engagement. And there are places. Um, and the coalition building. So, you know, they say uh, of snow, they say um, individually we fall from the sky and melt when we hit this uh, hit the ground, but together we can stop traffic. You know, this is set of snow. And um, so I see, when I see women all over the country um, getting engaged, and defending their reproductive rights, that gives me hope. When I see, you know, we've talked about the example in St. Paul, I think in Minneapolis, the voter restoration work and that coalition that's, that said that if you've committed a crime for the rest of your life, you're not able to devote, that's ridiculous. I mean, that's absolutely ridiculous. And, and you know, that coalition that rejected that, that gives me hope. So any and of and as you might imagine, um, the progress of reforms like ranked choice voting also gives me hope because I think it will lead to a more representative, more responsive, multiracial democracy, and that's what we need. Yeah, I love it, Kim. If people wanted to find out more information about ranked choice voting, um, where would they go? Should they just Google that, or is there a particular site or a place? Yeah. If people were interested in learning more about um, ranked choice voting, I would recommend they go to fairvoteminnesota.org. And Anika, if if the listeners wanted to learn more and 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 hopefully be inspired by this all female city council, where would they go to find out who is serving and and find out more information about that journey? Absolutely, it'd be stpaul.gov. So um, all of our pages are on there. There's a city council tab they can go to for um, the city of St. Paul. Sounds good. You know, I just want to share that um, this conversation brings me hope. I think that um, we have had many moments where um, progress felt impossible mm -hmm. until we saw it. And, um, you know, progress is not perfect. Um, and there are many ways for us to engage. And I really appreciate you all lifting up the power of ranked choice voting. You've talked about the ways in which it, it allows for coalition building, that it deepens the understanding and the possibility that can happen um, in terms of the candidates. Anika, thank you for running. I know for certain that when uh, women and people that are reflective run, it inspires the next generation of people to run. Mm -hmm. And um, it is about public policy, but it also was very much about representation. Mm -hmm. And I think about um, the moments, and I was going through some photos where um, my, my granddaughter, Nakai, was watching TV with me when um, we had the first woman of color become vice president. Mm -hmm. When Katanji Brown, um, got appointed to the Supreme Court. I'm watching her watch the television and I can see through her eyes what I wasn't able to see through my eyes at her age. Mm -hmm. And um, this is what we're ultimately talking about is progress. 
that I didn't know what I was missing until I saw it show up in many cases. And so um, this is an opportunity for us to live into those future generations, Anika, that you talked about. And as many as our Native relatives talk about, you know, seven generations ahead, that's the work that we're doing now as we participate uh, in our democracy. So thank you both, Kim Nelson, Anika Bowie. Thank you so much for joining Conversation with Shonda and sharing your wisdom and your passion for our democracy. To explore more insightful conversations and stay updated on Shonda Smith Baker's work, visit smithbaker.co. That's smithbaker.co. This episode is supported by the African American Leadership Forum.